Greetings from Tokyo. My name is Daisuke Beppu, and I hope all of you are doing well. Today, if you'll let me, I'd like to share with you my top 10 favorite films from the Criterion Collection. I'd like to preface this video by saying up front that this list is obviously very subjective. It is one that I came up with on my own after many hours of consideration about all of the Criterion Collection films. This list also is basically a reflection of my feelings about the films themselves rather than taking into consideration any supplemental material or other extra feature that might be on that particular Criterion Collection release. So please take this list that I'm about to give you as a list of films that I like that are in the Criterion Collection. With that in mind, let's, uh, let's begin, shall we? So the first film I want to show is this one, Mike Lee. Life is Sweet. This is spine number 659. Now, this is a really nice, typical Mike Lee film in that we are talking about uh, a British family, a British family that seems to be, it's not quite clear, but they seem to be um, lower middle class, maybe, uh, upper working class. They, uh, the mother works, the father works, and there are two children, the two children being uh, twin sisters. And it's about their lives living in London. It is a really funny film, and it is a very sad film. And it's, I don't know how to explain it except to say that it kind of creeps up on you the way it, um, the way it delivers its emotional punches and boy when you know you don't really expect them to come but when they come they really do appear and it's just a, it, it's it's fabulous fabulous the performances here by all the character uh, by all the actors are really excellent led by the great Alison Stedman and the great Jim Broadbent as the mother and father respectively and their children, um, played by uh, Claire Skinner, a wonderful actress Claire Skinner, and Jane Horks, just fantastic, fantastic performance by the two of them. Uh, Jane Horks especially is so nuanced and so uh, her performance is so layered. It's really wonderful, and the two of them together, when th when they're on screen together, it's just electric. I. I don't know. It's this is my favorite film by by Mike Lee. Really just phenomenal. It's it it knocks you. It's a it's a knockout of a film. Really is. I really recommend this if you haven't seen it. Again, Spine 659, Life is Sweet. Next one is Spine number 265. Shortcuts. This is the Robert Altman film uh, from 1993. Now, this is one of those uh, Robert Altman films where he has a multiple number of characters that are interacting with this large landscape of a tableau which is called Los Angeles based on short stories by Raymond Carver this is the blu-ray um, the DVD set I don't think it's available in the set anymore because this has the book shortcuts which is a collection of Raymond Carver stories uh, where Robert Altman took the inspiration for, for this film. This is a, I don't know, th this is where, uh, you know, the early 90s was where Robert Altman had a sort of, um, how should I put it, like a, uh, maybe a sort of a Hollywood uh, box office renaissance, as it were. He really came, you know, he, he made the film The Player before this, and he just had a, uh, he was on a roll, really, and Shortcuts 
sort of solidified his 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 standing in Hollywood, as it were. This is a fantastic, fantastic film. I can't tell you enough how much I love this film. All of the disparate parts coming together to form some kind of you know uh, human drama sometimes on a very intimate scale, sometimes on a very epic scale, sometimes can be very funny, other times really tragic, and some parts even horrifying. And it's just, um, you sit back and you think, wow, this is the landscape of the human experience. Everything is here about humanity in this film. This is a really fun, fundamental film, important film, and wonderful film. If I had to pick out any any highlights from my point of view has to go to Annie Ross um, as the the mother and the the lounge singer uh, her voice and her songs are the sort of through line of the film uh, and you hear those songs and her singing it's just really wonderful Annie Ross is I love Annie Ross and also um, the uh, oh yes yes the Jack Lemon appearance it's very short but it is incredible Jack Lemon in this film is astonishing, absolutely astonishing. I really have to hand it to Robert Altman. He he really knows how to make a tableau film like Shortcuts, and it doesn't feel like a labor or a chore watching it. You just sit there mesmerized, and then you realize something profound is about to happen, and it does, and poof, you move on to something else entirely, and it, it's it's so astonishing. and. The running time is quite long, I think. It's 187 minutes, but it feels very short. Really highly recommend it if you haven't seen it. It's Shortcuts. This is Blu-ray and this is the DVD. Twin Peaks, Fire Walk With Me. This is spine number 898. Um, a word of warning, buyer beware, caveat emptor. Do not watch this film unless you have seen the first two seasons of Twin Peaks because watching this film you know gives away a lot that is left unanswered in those first two seasons so please do not watch this film unless you've seen the first two seasons of Twin Peaks with that in mind this is an astonishing film this has to be my favorite David Lynch film and I like my David Lynch films very much there is something just so odd and off and weird about it. it it's what I like about it so much um, is that it has uh, such odd uh, inconsistencies with its narrative. There's a lack of uh, coherence in the narrative, which I think it's it, it's one of its strengths, really. And it feels like uh, a couple of episodes or maybe two or three episodes of the TV series that have been bunched together into a film. Now, I think the latest season, the the, um, the so-called return season of Twin Peaks, um, really helps to reevaluate this film or helps someone to reevaluate this film because there are a lot of things about the new season that tie into this film. Um, and so hopefully this film will get reevaluated more positively because it's been regarded in some circles at least to be one of Lynch's lesser works, which I completely disagree with. I think I've always felt that this is his best work by far because um, there is at its core a real sense of optimism. And I'm not sure if the optimism is is is, uh, is due to any kind of religious feelings that that Lynch, as the filmmaker, has. But there is something to be said about that possibility. Um, the performances here are fantastic, which you know it it, it shouldn't surprise you that they are. Um, yes, this is the key key film in David Lynch's uh, catalog, and Cheryl Lee as Laura Palmer is probably, this is probably one of the, the finest performances um, I think are out there. You know, um, I have a bunch in my mind that I think are perhaps most memorable and she is up there. She's up there, for, you know, 
like it's her and I have another performance um, by Toshiro Mufune and Yojimba. I think that performance is really great. But this is fantastic. This is a fantastic performance by her. You are mesmerized by her story. You feel for her. She is not afraid to show you the flaws of the character and she is very brave in some scenes. Really brave. It's stunning. It's absolutely stunning. And the... You, what I love too is that you feel like this should be like a culmination of the events that happen in Twin Peaks. But the more you real, the more you watch it, the more you realize that more questions are asked and they are left unanswered, which is very frustrating. But that is the key to Lynch's work, I think, is frustration and wanting to know more and the the sort of the the um, the cryptic nature of human existence and what humans can do to one another and the optimism that still exists despite the ugliness in the world this is a fantastic film a fantastic film and one of my favorites in the criterion collection twin peaks fire walk with me incidentally this blu-ray includes the missing pieces which is a 90 minute collection of the various scenes that were not included in the final cut of the film. Now the missing pieces section also is very important because it reveals some aspects of the plot or of the mythos of Twin Peaks that were hitherto not addressed. And they were further elaborated upon in the new series. So in fact I would say that the missing pieces, or at least some of them anyway, are maybe canon to the Twin Peaks uh, universe. So therefore, it's really important to watch the Twin Peaks Missing Pieces as well. But I think that Missing Pieces is its own entity, its own thing, and it's separate from Twin Peaks Fire Walk With Me because this, I think, already exists well as it is. I don't think we need to insert the missing pieces into this to create a longer film of Twin Peaks Firewalk with me. I think they should be separate and I'm glad that they are left separate. But the missing pieces is also a really fun and entertaining and illuminating watch. Highly recommended. So Twin Peaks Firewalk with me and the missing pieces also on this disc. Spy number 837, The Decalogue. Krzysztof Kieślowski's The Decalogue. Now, this is a monster of a release because this has all 10 episodes of the Decalogue television show that was shot, uh, that was well, released or shown in 1988 for the first time. And it also includes the film versions of two of those episodes. So the film version titles being a short film about killing and a short film about love. Now, I, I, I admit that I don't usually like to consider television film, a television series as like, you know, on the whole and include it as one title. But I like this release because the Decalogue as a whole really is an, an organic living thing. You know, each episode I think is really brilliant, but taking together as a whole, you realize that Kieslowski really is trying to make a point about this notion of uh, of modern day human existence and uh, the tenets of uh, of the, sort of the Ten Commandments, and whether or not there's a tension there. I mean, is it really possible to 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 live one's life? Uh, under this moral code, or is it not possible given the the sort of um, uh, the deep uh, fundamental cracks and uh, 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 the horrors and the good things and bad things that have existed in society and in human history, etc. As an entertainment, this packs a wallop. Each episode is only about an hour long, so you don't have to binge watch it. Just watch it slowly and let it sink in. The first episode just hits you like a like a sledgehammer. Really, it's amazing, absolutely amazing. Once you watch the first episode, you're hooked. Some of the episodes, I admit, are a little bit, for me, not as affecting as others, but even the less affecting ones, I think, have a lot of interesting things to say. So um, my personal favorite, I think, is episode four. Yes, my personal favorite is episode four, followed by episode uh, five, and then episode eight, 
and then episode uh, two. Yes, those probably are my four favorite episodes from this. But um, man, man, if you haven't seen this, you really should. I think if anyone were to ask me what is the recommendation for the one Criterion Collection title to recommend to a newbie or to someone who doesn't know the Criterion Collection, I always say this, the Decalogue. Everything you need to know about film, about human struggle and drama, and um, everything you need to know about life, just get it from this, the Decalogue. It's fantastic, absolutely fantastic. Spine number 837, Decalogue. Spine number 303, Bad Timing, Nicholas Rogue's film. This is the film that was uh, released in 1980 with Teresa Russell, of course, and Art Garfunkel, of course, and also Harvey Keitel in a minor, but maybe supporting role, but a very key role as the sort of police detective. But the, yeah, the, the electricity on the screen when Teresa Russell when he's when she's on the screen it's it's undeniable she has a certain presence and charisma that is really unparalleled she, it's it's like it's like watching a force of nature when you see her act and it's so wonderful her character is um uh, Milena right so Milena is such a flawed and interesting and vulnerable and strong fascinating character and Teresa Russell just is dynamite absolutely dynamite and she's so beautiful and brave and so uh, she, she's so willing to show you just the depths of that character and that is the that is the essence of great acting you know this has to be one of the great acting performances uh, of anyone, really, she is such. She's probably she's probably one of the great actresses of our time. She should be more celebrated. It's just wonderful, absolutely wonderful. And this is by far, I think, just her her crowning achievement. Wonderful performance. And not to take anything away, uh, Art Garfunkel. Now, Art Garfunkel in this film is a revelation. I didn't realize that he was such a fantastic actor but he is he is a really just unbelievably brilliant so brilliant um there's a a trajectory in his character uh which is um, yeah uh, alex right the trajectory in alex's character which is fascinating and brilliant and frightening and stunning just stunning without spoiling anything the trajectory of this film is absolutely stunning and now this is a Nicholas Rogue film and Nicholas Rogue is as you may or may not know he's known for providing fragmented um, narratives in other words the narrative tends to leap backwards and forwards in time and um, it's really interesting because essentially what you have here is a film that is about the trajectory of a relationship between one man and one woman so it's not necessarily the most I mean on paper when you think about that it's not necessarily the most um, original uh, plot but the way it is told is fascinating because we go from maybe the 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 present day to the past back to the present and the and it is, it's it's really labyrinthine in terms of how it presents the story up to a very climactic moment which is a real I won't say anything more it's except to say my goodness my mind was blown absolutely blown <sighs> yeah this is a fantastic film it's not for everyone because it can be very intense at the places very very intense but if you haven't seen it what are you waiting for Spine number 303, Bad Timing. This is only available on DVD, unfortunately. Um, so those of you who are just collecting Blu-rays probably won't come across this, but I highly, highly, highly recommend that you get this DVD because it is fantastic. Nicholas Rogue, Bad Timing. Spine number 
135, Rebecca. This is 1940 film directed by Alfred Hitchcock. Here is the Blu-ray and here is the older DVD set. This DVD set was out of print for a long time, but then Criterion released the Blu-ray of Rebecca very recently. So I'm glad of that because this is a really lovely film. Alfred Hitchcock has a long and very illustrious career, obviously, as a filmmaker. He made some classics, some considered to be the greatest films ever made. Rebecca, to me, is such a fascinating work in Alfred Hitchcock's canon, as it were. Wow, it's a romantic film. It is lush and it is intimate. It's just propelled by three dynamic performances. You've got Judith Anderson as Mrs. Danvers, fantastic villain, one of the great villains in screen history, I'd say, Mrs. Danvers. You've got Laurence Olivier as Maxim de Winter, uh, this sort of brooding, deep, dark, uh, fascinating, rich, handsome man. And then you have the I character, the unnamed heroine, who is played with such brilliance and delight and charm by the, the effervescent, beautiful Joan Fontaine. I remember watching this for the first time on a VHS tape as a kid and I just it was one of those films where I'd finish it and I'd rewind it and I'd play it over again. It's just a fantastic film. It, it, it has a certain wonderful combination of mystery and there's a mystery element a kind of a whodunit element almost and there's also a real romance and charm and gothic feel obviously um i love this film the, the, you know there are so many wonderful charming moments but i think for me the greatest moment is where it's a, such a simple moment too it comes early on when uh, the joan fontaine character is having breakfast with maxim de winter at the hotel in monaco and she's talking about her father who died very recently um, and you could tell from her expression that she really loved her father. And Maxim asks her, well, what did he do? And she says, oh, he was a painter. And Maxim says, oh, what did he paint? And, uh, you know, uh, was he a good painter? And, you know, uh, uh, she responds, yeah, I don't think she, well, he painted the same tree over and over again. And he, she said that, you know, he had a theory that, if you find something that you love, you know, you should stick with it. And so that's why her father found this tree that he obviously loved and just stuck with it and just painted it over and over again. I'm paraphrasing, of course, but it's such a delightful story about, um, uh, you know, it's sort of a metaphor for uh, kind of romance in the modern age, I suppose. But it's such a delightful story, and, and the way that Joan Fontaine delivers that that scene, it comes very early on in the film. It's just so charming and lovely. Oh, gosh, Rebecca is such a wonderful film. I love this film so much. If you haven't seen it, please, please, please buy it. You know, you won't, uh, uh, you won't be disappointed, I promise. Rebecca. Eight and a half, spy number one four zero, Federico Fellini, of course, nineteen sixty three, starring the great, great, great Marcello Mastroianni. Now this is the DVD set. Now, I haven't opened it because I have the Blu-ray also right here. I remember when I first saw this film. I was probably a freshman in in college I think so many many years ago <laughs> I hated the film I absolutely hated the film I thought it was so meandering and pointless and odd and just difficult to follow just odd really odd I was so I was I'm not used to the Italian way of filmmaking and the in the overuse of dubbing and ADR and I just didn't understand the the reason why I should follow this the Marcello Mastroianni character Guido and he's got all these women and, and these weird visions and, and bleh, you know, I just, just hated it. 
and then I was I got a little older and uh, I bought the blu-ray just you know happenstance and I just put it in one day once much later you know I was married I had children and I saw this film again on the uh, you know with all that context of my own life and it blew me away it just just blew me away to the point now it's now if someone asks me what are your favorite films this is up there at the top of the list or you know amongst the films at the top of the list <sighs> the way that Fellini is so unashamed of his uh, sort of masculine tendencies and you know his um, um, uh, yeah the way he thinks about women it's just so unabashed and so raw and just says, you know, take me for who I am, which is essentially what the what the Marcello Mastroianni character tries to to do, you know. And what what's great though is that, you know, Guido is not necessarily he's not just a womanizer, you know, he's a real earnest, fascinating character who's trying to find some kind of I don't know, some kind of um, uh, weight in his life, something that that will give him a bit of um, stability. And his wife, right, uh, played by the gorgeous Anouk uh, Ame, uh, is probably the one that will probably do that, but there's obviously a tension between the, the two of them in the relationship because he's having all, you know, he's having an affair with this the Sandra Milo character and, and he's, you know, obviously uh, in love with a lot of other women. So what is he going to do? On top of that, he's trying to make this big film, which is supposed to be an expression of his his own sort of personal inner demons, etc. Amongst all that, it's it's just it's a story about a man trying to find peace with himself, and in that context, it is so touching and it's so moving. You know, the last maybe ten minutes of the film are amongst the most moving I've ever seen in any film that I've seen. If I were to pick one scene out of this film, though, it's got to be the, um, uh, yes, the Roomba, Saragina's Roomba, in the, around the middle of the film. You look at, I remember seeing Saragina for the first time uh, in pictures, and I thought she was so kind of ugly and scary. But I see the Roomba, and I see her dancing on the beach with the young boys watching. She's the most beautiful woman. In that moment she's the most she's the only woman in the world and she's so beautiful and so magnificent and lovely and all she wants to do is she just wants to make these boys happy right that's all she wants to do and she has a lovely presence about her I would man I would love to have been one of those boys and sitting on the beach and watching her do her Roomba oh so lovely and that's just emblematic of how much I love this film it's film wonderful film eight and a half Otto e mezzo, Sugup. Four, three, two. Spine number four, three, two. Mishima, A Life in Four Chapters. This is the film by Paul Schrader, released in 1985. This is the old DVD set, which I've had for the longest time. This is one of the first Criterion Collection uh, DVDs I ever bought, actually. And very recently, Criterion very wisely released the Blu-ray of Mishima. And they kept the wonderful gold, this fantastically grotesque gold and pink uh, color design, which is so emblematic of Mishima, the writer. Now, I must admit, I'm not a fan of Yukio Mishima's writings. I've read quite a few of his novels, and I'm, for the most part, there are some that I, I admire, but most of them I really don't admire, and I, I'm, I, I, don't, I don't like them very much. But I love the depiction of Mishima as portrayed by Ken Ogata in this film directed by Paul Schrader. This is one of the most fascinating films in the Criterion Collection. It deserves to be discussed more. It deserves to be seen by more people. Paul Schrader is this American guy, and he goes to Japan with a Japanese crew, more or less, and with Japanese actors and actresses, and he makes a film in Japan about Yukio Mishima, who is arguably one of the more 
controversial figures in modern liter uh, Japanese literary history, and certainly in, in, in modern history of Japan, especially if you know what happened to Mishima in 1970. So the audacity of the production itself deserves uh, a lot of praise. It's, it's very, um, uh, pr very praiseworthy. But amongst that, you've got this wonderful mix of theatricality and documentary, pseudo-documentary style filmmaking. To, um, you know, the, the, the film premise is you've got the last day of Yukio Mishima depicted, and along the way you have basically three short excerpts from novels that are depicted in these very slush, lavish, let's say 20 minute sequences or so. So the first sequence is based on the novel or part of the novel of the Temple of the Golden Pavilion, King Kakuji. The next snippet or excerpt is based on a portion of the novel, Kyoko's House, uh, Kyoko no Ie, which I don't think has been translated into, a f and I don't think it's been officially published in English, although I'm sure an English translation is available. Then you have the film or the, the snippet Runaway Horses, which is the second f book in Yukio Mishima's Sea of Fertility uh, sequence. Uh, and so it, it's, it's a very interesting or, and it's a very interesting selection because it, 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 there's a real heavy sense of, of um, uh, Japanese uh, um, uh, militarism and the sort of uh, uh, right-wing fervor that um, I think uh, occupied much of Yukio Mishima as an artist and as a well as a political figure really and then so you have those three sequences and then you have the overall sort of um, sequence about the last day of Yukio Mishima those three sequences are so heavily stylized in lush color in these wonderfully uh, constructed sets. Set design by Eiko Ishioka is unparalleled and marvelous and fascinating. And then you have the performances in those Yukio Mishima stories told while we have the life of Yukio Mishima told in this sort of overarching uh, backstory where uh, Mishima is portrayed by Ken Ogata. At the end of this, you feel exhausted. You feel like you've been just, you know, um, you've experienced something beautiful and lovely and grotesque and violent. And at the end of the day, right, you don't know. I think you're left wondering who Mishima really was because he's still such an enigma. But that's really what great biopics should do, right? They should make you feel interested in knowing more about this, this person, this real-life person, but also leave you feeling like not all of the questions have been answered because I think Mishima was a very complicated uh, person in history. And a film really respects that, I think. And, and it's really, uh, really respectful, and I really appreciate that. Again, the performance by Ken Ogata as Mishima is just brilliant. There is a sequence there where it's just him in this Japanese um, uh, kind of uh, uh, old Japanese house or dojo, I would think. And he's just there in a Japanese sort of style clothing. And it's him practicing his sword play. It's just a, like maybe a, a two, three minute sequence of just him and his sword play. And it's, to me, probably one of the great sequences in this film the way he handles the sword is it's brilliant now i'm not a swordsman uh but you can tell when someone is is well trained in swordsmanship and someone isn't right you can tell when actors are really not not really too good with a sword although they're trying their best here yeah ogata really just hits it out of the park and it's just one of the most beautiful simple, breathtaking sequences in a film that is filled with many breathtaking sequences. Mishima, A Life in Four Chapters. If you haven't seen it, please, please, please get it. I promise you, you will not be disappointed. Mishima, A Life in Four Chapters. Spine number 29. Picnic at Hanging Rock. 
This is the Blu-ray set, which has the the novel, actually, the original novel by Joan Lindsay, uh, which is a really great read. I, I recommend reading the book as well. The book is really great. The film is superb. There's also an old DVD of this, um, which I haven't opened because I have the Blu-ray, but the Blu-ray is highly recommended for the reason what I, which I've just uh, explained about the book. Peter Weir directed this film, and it was released in 1975. This is one of those films that I didn't realize was so good until I watched it. You know, it, it's. It, I, I remember the first time I saw this, which was on this Criterion Collection Blu-ray, and I put it into the machine, and it was, you know, it was maybe around 10 o'clock at night, and I put it in, and I finished, and when it was over, I just stopped, and I took a breath, drank a glass of water, and then pushed play and watched from the very beginning again. It's ph phenomenal. It's phenomenal. It just blew me away. Rachel Roberts stars in this film as Mrs. Appleyard. Now, Rachel Roberts is just a revelation in this film. She already, she you know, you, you she's already a great actress, right? Um, but here she is ferocious, absolutely just uh, uh, like a like a hurricane or, or something. When she comes onto the screen, you know that something is going to erupt. And I don't mean erupt in terms of violence or or physical physical um, uh, acting in any way. But I just mean in terms of her demeanor and presence and just aura. She her aura just screams, just. Like f frightening. She's absolutely frightening character, and that is the perfect depiction of Mrs. Appleyard. I think Rachel Roberts is just so wonderful in this film. Um, yeah, the the great thing about this is you also have the great music, um, and you have the the lush uh, uh, cinematography. It's, it's so beautiful, and you see the 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 sunshine through the trees when the girls are at the at their you know excursion at Hanging Rock, and the mystery about the disappearance of these girls, what happened to them. It's just uh, hypnotic absolutely hypnotic you will fall in love with this film when you see it if you haven't seen it before I promise you you will the book is I think a quick read and it's so electric there are some things in the book that are not depicted or depicted in the in the film but that's not to the film's detriment at all um, and yes I don't want to say anything more because I might anything I say might spoil the film, so I don't want to say anything further about the the, the the plot of the film. What I will say is this: f yes, what was I going to say? Yes. So uh, the the other thing I like about this is the actress Helen Morse, who plays Mademoiselle, the French teacher, and who's sort of uh, on good terms, friendly terms with the girls. She is really lovely and delightful, and she has a real sense of, how shall I say, uh, reason. She's a sense of reason in the film. She's the anchor of the film. That's the, the, the character that you follow when everything, when, you know, when everything just goes to hell and just things start to fall apart and deteriorate in ways which are just, just tragic, absolutely tragic. Picnic at Hanging Rock. This is one of the great releases from Criterion. Um, yeah, I highly recommend that you get it. And yes, spine number 29, Picnic at Hanging Rock. Spine number 804. This has to be my favorite film in the Criterion collection. One of my favorite films ever. When I saw it for the first time, this was when it was released on Criterion just blew me away and it, I think it, it's it's one of those films that really changed my life because it changed the way um, I saw film and it's this a brighter summer day by Edward Yang 1991 now this film has not been available for the longest time and for the longest time you could only see it on these terrible 
like bootlegs and I think there was even a version that was made available on YouTube at one point maybe it still is available I don't know but it was just it's just a terrible uh, the print was in bad condition and you had the subtitles burned into the film really really terrible but when Criterion released this, it was one of those historic releases because no, I didn't think I'd ever be able to see this film in such a beautiful form and presentation that Criterion has made it. But it's really beautiful. And it's a really long film, you know, 236 minutes, but it goes by so quickly, so quickly. Um, you know, I said it changed my life because I, well, I don't want to say too much except that if I were to distill that feeling I have into sort of a few comments it would be that the main character of Shao Si played by the wonderful Chang Chen. So Shao Si is the main character, he's the protagonist and he's the character that we follow from the very beginning to the very end and what a trajectory that character follows. Uh, my goodness, what a trajectory indeed. I see so much of myself in Shao Sir. I really do. And it's amazing and and scary <laughs> to think about what happens to Shao Sir's character and the way little things in life, little miscommunications between him and his friends can lead to such dramatic consequences down the line. It's really amazing. Um, his relationship with his his family was also something that I find very very you know find very close to my own relationships. Um, I'm not Taiwanese, uh, so I don't relate to the film in the context of modern Taiwanese history, but I do relate to it in terms of the human uh, connections and the human um, the character developments. Yeah, I, I'm just thinking about this film now. It's just, it's, it's stunning to me. It's just a stunning, stunning thing. Um, I don't want to say anything more because if I say anything, it'll just spoil it. Just take my word for it. This film is a masterpiece. You will not be disappointed. Do not be um, dissuaded by the long running time. I know it's a bit much. I know four hours is a lot to ask, but I promise you it will go by so quickly. I promise you. I promise you, you will find it engaging. I really do. You don't have to know anything about Taiwanese history to find this film engaging. Of course, if you do appreciate Ch um, Taiwanese history, you'll find this even more engaging. But you don't have to have anything, any preparation, except um, a willingness to watch a four-hour film that is really, really good. It's a really, really great film. Um, this is the best film from the Criterion Collection, for my money. The best film. The best film. This is the best... Yeah, the, the film itself is, is just... Please go get this film, A Brighter Summer Day, Edward Yang, 1991, Spine number 804. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. I'm sorry about my rambling comments at some places, but I really love the Criterion Collection, and hopefully, if you're watching this, maybe you like the Criterion Collection as well. Um, if you have any suggestions about what other films that you like in the Criterion Collection, please let me know. Um, you can always let me know in sending a comment at the bottom of this YouTube video, or you can find me on Facebook. Uh, my name is Daisuke Beppu, so you just find me there. And I'm in many of the Criterion Collection themed Facebook groups, uh, so you can find me, maybe send me a, a message, and we can discuss further. I love talking about films. I love talking about Criterion Collection films very much. And there are so many films in the Criterion Collection, I know. And, and so everyone has his or her own favorites. I really uh, appreciate that. And so I'd love to hear what your favorites are. And um, yes, uh, keep watching films and keep watching more Criterion Collection films. They're all really great. 
I hope you have a great rest of the day and thank you so much for watching. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Anyway, take care.